Hello there again, friends and neighbors. It's me, your girl, Stella Hendricks, back again. Thank you so much for coming again to my channel. And I am super excited to start off this new little project of mine, uh, Stella's Book Club, where we will read all of the fascinating books uh, written by playmates, bunnies, girlfriends, uh, people in the Playboy world. I'm really excited about it. I absolutely love those books. Uh, and I really particularly love when these girls write uh, books telling their unique stories. It really helps um, to make the world seem more real. And it's very interesting to see other people's perspectives and to see uh, how other people were affected by it um, because of course I've never been in that world. I fantasize about it and I have my own ideas about what it would be like but I pretty much only have my uh, speculations. Uh, today we are going to be starting off this book, The Girl in the Centerfold. Uh, it's by Suri Marsh. Uh, that's a, a pseudonym of hers. It's the name that she uses in her Playboy centerfold. Why don't I show you guys again? She's so beautiful. It's such a cute picture. I just, oh, I love, this is one of my favorite centerfolds. I probably say that all the time, but it's true. <laughs> love it. Love it, love it, love it. All right, so of course I can't read the whole chapter. Like I can't read the whole book chapter at a time. I'm pretty sure that's plagiarism. And that would take so long um, and you guys really should buy the book and read it. It's so interesting. And I tend to mark up my books like crazy. Um, that's one reason that I love, um, I prefer having, uh, printed books, especially paperbacks, instead of, I'm um, getting them on Kindle and stuff because then you really can mark things up and make notes about what you find interesting and what you want to say. Um, I love audiobooks. I go through audiobooks like like water. I think I listen to an audiobook a week, uh, typically speaking. Uh, but you can't mark those up, you know. So um, like with Holly Madison's uh, Down the Rabbit Hole, I originally uh, listened to that one. It always reminds me of the rodeo because I was a Jack Daniels girl in the rodeo. <laughs> uh, at the same time that I was listening uh, to that book, uh, like on my break and in the morning getting ready and stuff, I'd be listening to Down the Rabbit Hole. Uh, but I had to go and buy an actual copy of it, a physical copy of it too, so that I could mark it up because it's so interesting. So let's dive right in. The Raps are off as one of Playboy's sexiest playmates tells her very intimate story. She's so gorgeous. As Surrey Marsh, I was photographed in the nude for millions of Playboy readers. A lot of people would call that shocking. I don't. Not in comparison with the rest of my story. She was a beautiful and virginal 18 year old girl who came to America seeking fame, fortune, and romance. What she found was something else. Now three years older and many men wiser, she has written a startlingly frank account of her fall and rise in the empire of super sex. A candid confessional, going overboard on a few sex scenes, a tale of shocking admissions and intimate inside revelations about the life of a playboy club bunny who suddenly found herself chosen to be the girl in the centerfold. Her impressions of Hugh Hefner and his coterie, coterie at the Chicago Pleasure Palace are full of surprises. She seems sincerely moved to get the whole story off her chest by Publishers Weekly. So it's got that, a little picture of her. I think it's, yeah, I think it's just the same one. <laughs> Lovely Surrey Marsh gives you the whole picture. The picture is of course the glamorous total a total exposure offered to a lucky girl each month in the centerfold of Playboy. Millions of girls dream of becoming a playmate, idol of half the men in America. Thousands actually seek the experience, 
but only a few can be chosen to enter the charmed rectangle. <laughs> the charmed rectangle. Surrey Marsh is one of those who made it all the way. Now, Surrey tells with frankness and sincerity what she had to do to be chosen, what awaited her in Hugh Hefner's fabled Chicago mansion, and what was expected of her after she made the big scene. Her completely candid story takes you into the swinging inner sanctums of the world of Playboy, its pals and playmates, and into the tangled emotions of a girl who decided to play along. The Uninhibited Memoirs of Miss January. <laughs> Introduction. Oh, I probably have to move around a bit my back I have a terrible back my lower back always is killing me so if I shift about please forgive me how do you like to pose for the centerfold to be a playmate those were the first words spoken to me when I entered the never never land of playboy magazine playboy clubs playmates and Hugh Marston Hefner editor publisher creator and chief potentate potentate of this mammarian empire. In simplest terms, this is a book about what I said, what he said, and the very interesting things that happened after that and how I did become a playmate and how I came to get writer's cramp autographing my posterior for posterity and why it happened and how come I wish it hadn't. My posterior for posterity. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, again, I'm, I'm only reading some of this, um, the most important bits, I guess, uh, as they struck me. Playboy has many imitators, all of which run nudes and foldouts. I know because I'm suing one of them for running an unauthorized spread on me. She's referring to Penthouse, uh, I can't remember what month, of 1969. Uh, the same year, I believe, that this book came out. Um, I'll do some more research and let you know what I can find out about that. Uh, to my knowledge, they didn't get... Uh, honestly, to my knowledge, nothing. I don't know much about it. But I did know that she was in uh, Penthouse and that she uses the name Pat Fellows. Spread on me. But the imitators fail. Again, because of the genius of Hefner. Playboy's playmate is put on a pedestal. Because she is supposedly the girl next door, she has a name, address, family, career, and brains. She can cook, sew, be a perfect hostess, read tracts on Zen Buddhism, entertain on the guitar, or be the perfect companion, kind, considerate, thoughtful, attentive, tender, sexy, and emancipated. Even dogs love her. She is supposedly special, the elite of the women in the world. Therefore, she is rare. Only 12 among the supposed hundreds of applicants are selected each year. In 15 years of publication, only 180 have been honored by selection as playmate. I wonder how many that is nowadays. So one reason for writing this book is to give the 5 million readers of Playboy an honest, realistic look at one playmate. I'm also writing for girls and for women who wish they were girls. It was women, not men, who talked me into becoming a playmate. Women have two attitudes towards girls who pose as nature struck them. One attitude goes this way, you're sick. Having posed in the nude, I am therefore an empty headed exhibitionist with nothing to offer but a body and an insatiable, insatiable appetite for admiration of it. Needless to say, I'm a slut. The other attitude was expressed to me by way of a suburban housewife. To be a playmate would be the living end, a complete gas. To have your picture run in a magazine and to have millions of men admire you and desire you and to do it in safety so you don't have to be touched or hurt in any way, that would be the absolute end. I'd love it. I think there's more than just those two attitudes, but uh, those are apparently the two that struck Surrey. In 15 years of publication, there have been thousands and thousands of undraped bosoms and buttocks. 
More than just displaying skin, Playboy has made it respectable. Playboy is no dirty book hidden under the counter. It is a major American publication running over 200 pages at the minimum and filled with advertisements from the leading American corporations. Hefner writes something called the Playboy philosophy, which is a discussion of a very old morality, which is winning a new acceptance. I think part of it's old and part of it was very novel. An important element of this morality is that sex is fun. Sex is pure, sex is innocent, sex is right, and the last one in bed leaves the light on. The real reason I'm writing this book are two very personal motives. To the left and above of my exposed bo bosom, she's talking about in her centerfold, were the words Playboy's Playmate of the Month. What is a playmate? According to a leading dictionary, a playmate is a companion in games and recreation. Playboy's playmate is something else. She's a thing, hardly a girl or a person, who willingly takes off her clothes and displays her body for the satisfaction and satiation of boys, 8 to 80. The picture of a girl with her clothes removed can serve two purposes to a man, to satisfy curiosity and be a masturbatory fantasy. I'll admit, I didn't realize that when I agreed to be a playmate. I thought I was, oh, never mind what I thought. A playmate doesn't have a mind or a soul. I didn't know what to call her but a thing, a thing to be ogled, lusted over, and let's face it, jacked off over. She's not a wife or a mother, although many playmates have been. She's not even sexy. She has no private parts thanks to the post office department. She's all buttocks and bosom. She's a girl who has announced to the world that she's available, easy, and please leave the light on because I'm gorgeous. I want you to admire me and find pleasure in me. And don't worry, love isn't necessary. To put the matter in the simplest, least elegant, but most understandable terms, Playboy's Playmate of the Month is Miss Superfuck of the Month. I am not. I'm I, a real life person, flesh and blood, mind and heart, spirit and soul. I am God's creation, not Hefner's creation. I have been a Playboy's Playmate. I'm writing this book now to say who I am as a person. The other personal reason for writing this book might be self-explanatory if the title were The Education of Solve Solve Mellenborgen. That was the name given to me when I was born 20 years ago on a farm in Norway. I took the name Surrey Marsh both to hide my identity and to give people something they could pronounce. It's no exercise in self-pity to say that in just two years in America, I've learned a great deal. I've made about every mistake an 18-year-old girl from Norway can make. I've not always been a nice girl. I feel I've lost myself somewhere in the last two years, or perhaps I've never found myself in the first place. But I'm trying to find myself. And I'm hoping that by setting all this down, when I get to the end, I'll have found Solve Mellenborgen and what she stands for. I am not writing an expose of Hefner or Playboy or anyone connected with the organization. Obviously, some of the information I've set down will be surprising to some and shocking to others because of both what happened and what did not happen. Nor am I writing out of malice. My association with Playboy ended rather abruptly with me being chucked out, but I bear no grudge. Playboy treated me generally fairly and sometimes with kindness. I was paid generously for my services and I certainly had an adventure and cataloged an array of experiences, oh my yes. In my 20th year of life, I am older and a wiser girl thanks to Playboy. If it all turns out to be a huge mistake, I bear at least as much of the responsibility as Playboy. I would like it understood at the outset that I'm trying as best I can to tell it like it was. I know that some, to some this may be an exercise in sexual titillation. I can visualize some readers leafing through the book to pick out the dirty parts. He or she can go ahead. They'll undoubtedly find some. I know that not very many years ago such admissions by a girl occurred only in fiction. I'm not sure the times have, have really changed or ought to change so much but I submit that there can be no understanding of girls like me or the problems of the new sexual morality unless the matter is discussed with some frankness. I am hopeful that at least a few people will understand that my motive is neither self-pity nor self-advertisement. Because I am determined to tell it like it was, I must make this disclaimer. All the information set forth in this book is true. The names of a few have been changed to protect the wicked. So that is the introduction to this very interesting book. 
pardon my running nose all the time. I'm so embarrassed. Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts about that. Uh, very interesting. Uh, she does seem to contradict herself uh, quite a bit. Hang on, let me get my notes. Okay, the first thing I wanted to talk about was her comment that it wasn't men who talked her into it, it was women. Uh, later on in the story, I think that's a little bit uh, debatable. There's a one particular photographer who I think was a bit heavy handed. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to it. And I think he had a very big part of convincing her into it. I also thought that was really interesting that women talked me into it because I had an experience back in my Mormon days. Uh, before you go on your mission, I was missionary. Uh, you have to go through the temple and do this ceremony uh, that Mormons call the endowment. Uh, part of this ceremony, you wear these uh, ceremonial clothes, um, all in white. You have this <laughs> weird apron with fig leaves on it and you have like these drapery things around you. One thing that girls wear is uh, a veil and it mostly goes back over your head. But during this ceremony, they want you to veil your fucking face. Boy, let me tell you how much I love that. So from the first time, um, it's all secret. You don't know what's gonna happen when you first go in there. Uh, not even lifelong members know. It's supposed to be like a secret thing when you first go through the initiation. And I remember when we got to that part and they said like, okay, oh, we're gonna say the prayer. Sisters, please veil your faces. And I remember being mortified even at that moment and thinking to myself, this must be a test, right? <laughs> this is a test. You don't actually, like, am I supposed to stand up right now and say, no, I won't do this? Um, I kind of thought that maybe that's what I was supposed to do and I was a little bit confused and I looked around and I saw, um, cause you go and you do this ceremony in groups and my aunts and my mother and my grandmothers and all of these women who I looked up to and respected all dutifully covered their faces. And if for some reason that to this day, I do not fully understand when I saw them do that, I almost had like an out of body experience. I felt my hands reach up and cover my face too. The, the women talked me into it. Now it's much more complex than that. And really the person who talked me into it was myself. Um, in the end, I'm really big on personal responsibility. Your choices are your own. Your life is your own. People can influence you, but no one is your master. You are yourself. So something I think interesting too, though, was that this idea of being talked into it. I did not want to veil my face in the same way that I think that Suri did not want to take off her clothes. Don't let people talk you into things that feel wrong, whether it's covering yourself up or taking things off and exposing. Both of these things, uh, especially about your own personal body are deeply personal and aren't things that anyone else should be talking you into or out of. I think that's very interesting. Uh, also, <laughs> her two extraordinarily different perspectives on what a playmate is. Uh, in the beginning, she talks about how the playmate is supposedly the girl next door. She has a name, a family. She has brains. She reads. She can entertain. She has all of these things and they it's sort of uh, built up to make these pictures not just an inanimate object, but to make this a uh, girl to glorify the girl herself and her body is her crowning you know beauty but the whole girl herself is what is beautiful and desirable um i believe that hugh hefner said that he had gotten the idea i think from the vargas girls who are not real girls uh well i think some of them are based on um, real girls or models but there are illustrations of women perfect illustrations of absolute, you know, feminine uh, apex of beauty. Is that the right word? Um, but Hugh Hefner wanted that to be more uh, realistic. That he knew that that kind of beauty existed in 
real girls and the girl next door I think is the real girl idea behind it and I think that that's just so beautiful and lovely and then the next page over she talks about um let me see if I can find it because I don't want to misquote her She, a thing, a thing to be ogled, lusted over, and jacked off over. She's not a wife and mother. She's not even sexy. She has no private parts. I'm assuming that's talking about like the pussy. So are, you're upset that she doesn't, that it's not showing more, but it's also a horrifying thing to be lusted over and jacked off over. I think this shows some real deep hangups in our Miss Surrey. And I don't know how much uh, is from her, how much is uh, put upon her from society, which is also so funny to me because she's from Norway. And nowadays I know that the Scandinavians are super cool about like sunbathing in the nude and stuff. So I guess, you know, times they are a changing. But uh, t two issues there. One, why is the idea of a man a man's sexual satisfaction, why is that this horrifying idea? Why is it a horrifying idea that a man might see your naked pictures and jack off? That's like, that's such a bad thing. I think that that really shows the depth of uh, puritanical repressionism that is common, especially in America with our puritanical heritage uh, deep sex shaming uh, and a real disrespect and disgust I think for human sexuality but particularly for men the idea that a man would find you attractive and pleasure himself with you in mind is an insult and you know in our culture weirdly it is because uh, the insults we throw at people like cocksucker Honestly, giving oral is a really selfless act because it doesn't give a lot of pleasure to the giver, but only to the receiver. And we use that as this like super scathing insult. I, our society is weird, friends, a weird, that, that is, just strikes me as absolutely bizarre. Now, there absolutely are some people who uh, cannot sexualize a woman without feeling disrespectful towards them. I think because of the Judeo-Christian uh, puritanical upbringing that I've been talking about, I think has a very big impact on that. Um, I think that's why a lot of religious men have problems with pornography because they don't know how to properly sexualize their wife. They love her and they wanna have sex with her and sex is a dirty and bad thing to them and that creates, I think, massive hangups. I think that is a lot of what is influencing um, her ideas there. Also, um, let's say that there are people who will look at your picture and they will degrade you, which absolutely, absolutely they will. As a woman, if you do anything uh, sexually playful um, or at all exhibitionist, there are people who will treat you as subhuman. There are people who will look down on you, people who will try to hurt you for it but honestly i'm not gonna let those bastards win uh there you can there are some people who are so sick and horrible in the world that they will look at pictures of children and they will see something very different than perhaps what you and i would see does that mean that there is something wrong with the pictures of the children or does that mean that there is something wrong with that individual i think that uh, these nude pictures are in a way a mirror that is held up against each individual and the way that you react to it, it tells a lot more about you than it does about the nude model. <laughs> also, uh, you kind of know that it's not the mainstream idea to be super respectable to nude models. Thankfully, that's changing a lot nowadays. Great job, everybody, including Playboy, that we have, uh, we are overcoming that. But um, I don't think that that is a deterrent for me personally. It is certainly something you should be aware of when going into. I think that Solvay uh, didn't quite understand how uh, derided 
she would be for making that decision. But it reminds me personally a lot of when I was uh, not really in high school because I was so controlled by my parents, I couldn't do anything. But I went through a little phase, when was this? It was a while ago, of uh, dressing really goth. I love the goth aesthetic to this day. I will still do it. I love going to the goth club and I just love to dress up in general. And I've always admired that dark uh, kind of beauty. Absolutely love it. Uh, but my mom said, you know, why? Why will you dress up like this, Stella? Um, you know, it makes you look dark. It makes you look like, you know, a bad person. And I knew that there were people out there who would judge me harshly and badly for the way that I was dressing. Even though to me, I was dressing that way because I found it beautiful. I found it comforting. I found it to be something different and unique. And I looked at those goth clothes and I saw only beauty. My mother and some other people in society, when they looked at it, they saw darkness and the devil and wickedness. And it wasn't because any of those things were inherently in the clothes. It was just in their perception of it. Honestly, that just made me want to wear the clothes more because the kind of people who would judge you so harshly for the way you dress or what you wear or maybe what you don't wear are not the kind of people who I really want in my life. Those aren't, that's not the type of influence the type of people who will judge you immediately based on your appearance like that and decide things about your character. That, I, that's just a foreign idea to me and not something I've ever supported. And that's really, yeah, that's, that's a battle I'm willing to fight. Um, I think that's one reason that I choose to dress. <laughs> what might be termed sexily these days. I really like cleavage, I like to be very feminine. Um, and I know that just like with the goth clothes, there are people who will look at me and judge me and condemn me for it, but those people are wrong. And I am willing to take up this fight to make your personal choices for your body and yourself more acceptable and less something that would be immediately derided. I feel that people who uh, like pose in the nude, like Suri here, for example, she would pose in the nude and then there were these bad people who said mean things to her and made her feel very bad about herself and made her feel like she was nothing but, you know, the fuck of the month or whatever. Those people might feel that way, but their feelings do not dictate your reality. Those people are wrong. <laughs> And I am not going to cow to them and say, okay, because this guy is going to look at me and leer at me and be inappropriate towards me because of this. Oh, now I'm going to cover up. No, no, you don't let them take good things from you. You don't let the bad guys win. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> also, I think it's so interesting how she talks about how she had exposed her whole body and she thinks it's kind of scandalous now and she doesn't know that she would do it again. A, interesting, how did her pictures get over into penthouse? Uh, that, I don't know, that could have been completely innocent and not her fault at all. I have to look more into that. But also it occurred to me, what's this? In Playboy, you showed your whole body and you said that you came to feel bad about it, that people thought you were just super fuck of the month. And so you came out to write this book, which bears something, in my opinion, even more precious than your body, it's your soul. You're bearing your mind and your heart in here. And she says in here, I know that some guys will go through here and they'll just, you know, be looking for the sexy part. And you know, if you look for it, you're gonna find it. It's like, leafing through the book to pick out the dirty parts, he or she can go ahead, they'll undoubtedly find some. That is the exact same thing as what happens in Playboy. I think that the majority, I honestly have a very high opinion of men. I think that most men are not nasty, disgusting dogs like that. Perhaps back in the day, you know, the, the scales tipped a little more in other direction. But I think that most men do appreciate the absolute beauty and bravery of a girl doing something like that. 
And yes, they probably also jack off over her because she's gorgeous and very sexy and there's nothing wrong with that. But if that was a bad thing and you didn't want to do it and you decided it was a bad idea, why would you then go and bear an even more poignant part of yourself knowing that it's going to be jacked off over again? Girlfriend. <laughs> but she also says in here, you know, that I think in part in writing this book and perhaps why she contradicts herself like that is because she is trying to find herself, that she doesn't know yet exactly what it is that she stands for, but I think that she is trying very hard. And I think as I read this book, it felt very sincere to me if sometimes um, conflicting, perhaps she feels very conflicted in her soul in writing this. I think that, that, I, that as I say that, I think that that sounds about right. So uh, very interesting introduction. <laughs> For today, uh, I'm excited to read chapter one. Uh, it starts off in, I don't even know how to say the name of this place, Stor Elvd Elvdal. Stor Elvdal. That's the name of the town in Norway that she came from. We will pick that up and start reading it next time. And uh, if you have any input, if you have any insights, I would really, really like to hear them. And I think that is about it for today. So thanks so much friends and neighbors for stopping by for a little more Playboy exploration with me. And I guess I'll catch you on the flip side.